I took screenshots of the messages that he sent. I took screenshots of all his friends. He had a lot of family members listed. So I took screenshots of their profiles and I included them in a thread letter that I had written. And if you want, I can, yeah, I can read it. I can read one of the many thread letters. Hello, Mr. So-and-so. You have recently been speaking to a 15-year-old boy named Jack. I have saved documentation of all of your comments. Pretty much made it obvious that Jack didn't exist, that I had this explicit content. The ultimatum was, if you don't give me this $500 Amazon gift card, come tomorrow morning, I will send all of this information out to your family and friends and the police. Uh, you have until tomorrow morning to send me the gift card. I've had four aliases. Jack, Lisa, Caleb, and Ashley. I've made about 30 to 40 grand from a hundred people, <laughs> maybe more. My name is Ellen and I'm a professional blackmailer. So I uh, once attended a panel discussion and uh, one of the panelists played that uh, excerpt. And I usually don't play short excerpts of my work. And uh, you could tell why, because it was like the energy got completely sucked out of the room. Um, and I think when you have a big headline right up front like that, a salacious headline especially, people will jump to conclusions based on their preconceptions. Their guard goes up, and they have a difficult time uh, having those preconceptions challenged and viewing others as fully formed, complicated people. I've been helping people tell their stories on my podcast for the last 11 years, and we cover a wide variety of personalities. But besides an embracing of the complexities and contradictions of different people, I'd have to say that the one underwriting thread through all of the work that we've done has been to take our time we build slowly. As editors, we hold our cards until the last possible moment. This approach can sometimes make it a little bit more difficult to draw people in. But I find that when you can approach a story sideways, sometimes, sometimes you can get people to enter a world that they wouldn't otherwise because it's too alien to them. I'd like to tell you about one episode that we featured recently called A Girl of Ivory. It's about two people. Actually, it's about three, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, their names are Dave Cat and Shadore, and they first met at a goth club in Detroit. I was dancing to a song called Jesus Built My Hot Rod in the middle of the dance floor, and I saw him a little bit away from me, I couldn't stop looking at him dancing because he just loved the music so much. He was lost in it and although his moves perhaps weren't as cool as some of the others, it just looked like he was having a really, really good time. Well, it was like one of those things where it's just like, you know, I kind of saw her approaching through the crowd and it's just like, you know, you kind of see these blurs of other people, but I saw her distinctly. Do you remember what she was wearing? She had this like kind of top split down the middle, stockings, at the time, she had all purple hair. PVC bustier, arm length gloves, six inch stilettos, also PVC, and a Hello Kitty headband. Okay. So it's like, goodness gracious. I was basically immobile for like two minutes because I was so taken with her beauty. The first thing that he said to me was, have you got a cigarette? Which was really weird because I wasn't expecting him to be a smoker. So I was like, are you sure? He was kind of like coughing and spluttering and I was like, are you okay? And he was like, oh, yeah. Um, he was like, can I have your number? I thought, um, yeah, I really want to give him my number, but I'm not going to immediately do that because it would just be really obvious that I like him. So I was like, I don't know my number. And he was like, yeah, you do. I did lean in and I was just gazing into her eyes and then I kissed her and it was... It was, it was what I expected, yet not what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I think you can, uh, you can fill in the blanks on that one, but uh, the, the gist is that Dave Cat and Shidore uh, hit it off, and eventually they moved in together. Um, and soon after that, they got married. Sometimes people will either ask me or Shi Chun, what was one of the most memorable moments that you have ever had where you knew you two were in love? The answer that we have is always the same. It was a time, it was in autumn. Yeah, it was a week before Halloween. It was raining, not raining heavily, but just kind of lightly outside. And it was one of those nights where you're really glad to be inside and warm and snuggly. And he put on this film called Playtime. Votre film. It's a film by Jacques Tati, who is a French comedian. It was more or less his statement about the wistfulness of what was then old France, post-war France, being slowly taken over by modern France. I hadn't seen it before, but I found exactly the same bits funny that he did, and we were just really close. We were just wrapped up in each other's arms, just watching this film and just being there in the moment. I, I just had this feeling suddenly that everything was going to be OK. And I looked at him and I was like, it's not just everything's going to be OK, everything's OK now. That was literally one of the most content moments probably of my life. At this stage, Dave Cat and Shidori were a lot like any other couple. And it was at this stage that a Russian woman came into their lives by the name of Elena. I've always wanted to go to America. I used to go on the internet and look up the uh, style, fashion, music. I came across this documentary, these alternative couples. This couple, I just love them so much. I never seen anything like this in the world. They were beautiful people, they were interesting, they had interesting ideas and they were funny and they were laughing together and I loved them and I saw them on this video and I thought I want to be with them. I want to be with this guy, this girl and I like, I think I fancy them both. Okay, so I emailed them. I said, I want to live with you. Now, Elena didn't just want to move in with Dave Gat and Shidori. She wanted to form a romantic relationship with both of them. And here's the crazy thing, is that on the very first day that they, the, all three of them met together, they said yes. Does the issue of jealousy come up? Um, <laughs> uh, you mean Sidori jealous of me? Or anyone jealous of anyone. I mean, it's sort of... Mm. We have had to work out some things along the way. Um, I think the only time we had to all kind of be honest with each other was perhaps when... I can't remember when it was our wedding anniversary and that brought a bit of stuff up to the surface and I think we all dealt with it pretty well. What happened? Um, it, was, well. it was hard for me because it was a wedding anniversary and I don't have one. It's a very special thing for two people and there's something that Dave Cat and Sidori have together and I don't have a wedding anniversary and I think I was too emotional for this and it wasn't fair for Sidori and I'm sorry, I was mean but I was, I was jealous about that a little. Yeah. What happened um, was that the wedding anniversary fell on a night that it should have been Lenker and, yeah, and Dave cut together. And I, I, I had to say, oh, I tried to say it really casually, I think, but I didn't realise how hurt you were at the time. And actually, if I'd known how upset you were, I probably would have said, just don't worry, you can go no, in the bed that night. No, it's not fair. You were very kind to me. And, and I, I understand it's your wedding anniversary. You, you didn't get married to spite me. You were married before me. So it's wrong for me to feel jealous, but I'm human. And, I, you know, that's one part I will never have with Dave Cat and Sidori. I'll not be their wife. It's okay. It's just to get used to this. I think it's harder when things feel unsettled, but once people are all honest... Yeah. Life isn't perfect, is it? Yeah. I mean, it's not like I'm 100% happy all the time just because I'm married. At times yeah. I can feel a little bit jealous of you guys, you know. Yeah. Maybe he feels jealous of us some of the time. He's not a woman and... Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's OK, though, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, you're OK, it's fine. I'm just not clear on the logistics of it, like who sleeps with who, like when. Like, well, how does that well work? Each of us sleeps with Dave Cat. Alternately, we yeah. not sleep together at the same time. And 
me and uh, Sidore grab time together whenever we can. Mm -hmm. When Dave Cat is at work, mm -hmm. when Dave Cat is in the bath, <laughs> <laughs> he knows he's cool with it. He's not, he's, he doesn't mind us. And usually I sleep with Dave Cat because um, my joints aren't as stiff as Sidore. Mm. Uh, I'm just going to play that back in case you missed that last bit and then move on to the rest of the tape. Usually I sleep with Dave Cat because um, my joints aren't as stiff as Sidore. Mm. See, that's the thing. It's, that's, it kind of works to our advantage, though, because I say she's the mistress because Elena is more built for sex, mm -hmm. whereas Sidore, with her stiffer joints, although they have loosened over the past five years, she's more built for love. She has very, as you can see, loose joints. I mean, where, you, you know, you, you lift her hand and it doesn't stay. I mean, you can barely, like, turn her hand. Mm -hmm. Her hand will... Yeah, sure. Her fingers are actually kind of broken at this point because the wires that they use in the fingers are not as strong as they could be. Mm -hmm. But, uh, because they've all broken at, like, the base plate in her hand, right, which is right here if you put her hand right here. But, uh... I've always been intrigued by artifice. I remember distinctly being in second or third grade. My teacher, Miss Mahaffey, was standing at the blackboard writing whatever words in French. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, if she was a robot, what mechanisms would make her move her arm or her hand or her mouth or head, walk from the desk to the blackboard or whatever? I remember I was fascinated with that. It wasn't like a sexual attraction or anything. It was just like a fascination. So, uh, this is a picture of uh, Dave Cat, and uh, that's uh, Shidori on the left and Elena on the right. And uh, at this stage, we are about halfway through what was originally a 45 minute long radio story. And it's only now that we're getting to the heart of what it's really about. Dave Cat is a proponent of what he calls synthetic relationships. Thing is, with like organic relationships, a lot of them start out where it's just like you've got two people in love, two organics in love, and then there's going to be one person, actually, this happens with both of them, that has a perception of the person that they're attracted to. They're attracted to that perception and not necessarily the person that they actually are. So there's this image that they've built up in their mind. It's like, oh, yeah, Jennifer's really fantastic and uh, she's amazing and this and that and the other thing. And then somewhere along the line, as time progresses, wait, Jennifer, wait, no, she, she said she's voting for Trump? Wait, whoa, 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 she didn't say anything about that. You know, that sort of thing. Your idea of that person is suddenly going to be thrown to the wayside of running into what the person actually is. You don't get that with a synthetic. Everything's up front, there's no deceit. There's no nasty surprises. Whatever you make as far as like, their personalities, or if you don't make a personality at all, I mean, that's what you get. Um, so I'm sure there are some journalists in the audience who are familiar with this shape. This is an inverted pyramid. And the basic concept is that you start with the most important information and move in descending order from there. So you would begin with a headline, you move on to uh, a summary of the events and then less important information such as background and context. Now the inverted pyramid is a very, very efficient way of transmitting information. It's less good at giving the audience more of a transportive experience of finding a little bit of a pinhole in the audience's mind and widening it out just a little bit. At Love and Radio, uh, we take the opposite approach. Um, a right side up pyramid. Or I prefer to think of it more like, um, like a lab flask. Um, so in this case, from the top down, you begin with um, some kind of hook to bring people in. Uh, you fill out some of the background information. And then if you're working with the right subject, you get progressively more interesting as time moves on. Now, doing a move like we did with Dave Cat. Uh, and shout out to podcasting, by the way, that would be extremely difficult to pull off in nearly any other medium. Doing a move like that is not just 
a cheap plot twist that serves no other purpose than to shock the audience. By entering the story from the point of Dave Katz's fictional world, and he knows it's fictional, by the way, he is not delusional, we naturally have more empathy for him, and maybe we have a little bit more of an open mind. We don't abandon judgment, but maybe we're a little less prone to use it so forcefully. I think it's in large part because of that philosophy that led to this exchange in our conversation. They always say it's like, you know, if you're dating, you know, you get rejected. You just pick yourself up and move on. For me, it just takes time because I'm thinking, okay, she's rejected me. Why? Why has she rejected me? I, I think some people might hear you say this and think that, well, if it wasn't for this fear of rejection, then he would just have like an organic or, group. organic relationships. You know? Yeah. Is that true? Or like, what do you think? <sighs> I wouldn't say it's entirely false. If I had had a lass that said, yeah, Dave Cat, you know, you and I should go out. And then it turned out to be fantastic from that point onward. Or if I wasn't afraid of rejection where it wasn't fantastic and I could get back up on the dating horse and try again. Yeah, that's probably where I would be. I don't think I would have an interest in dolls or gynoids or whatever, but I, I think I would be a, a markedly different person. I don't know if I'd have anything of note to say about myself. The fact that I'm fascinated with dolls and gynoids and that these two lovely creatures are in my life contribute to a large part of who I am. I mean, they're not totally who I am, but they help the rocket boost to whatever lunatic planet I'm heading for. Are you still open to dating organic women? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, judging another human being, passing judgment, uh, is a kind of violence. And that doesn't mean that it's, uh, that it's not okay to laugh. It's okay to laugh. And as an interviewer, you can ask lots of tough questions. You can be skeptical. You can push back. But the moment you pass judgment, it, it wounds people. I've seen this happen in all the interviews that we've done. And people close off, and the conversation ends. I'm not saying that judgment is never called for, because the Lord knows these days it, it certainly is. But I think when we use it, we need to use it consciously and sparingly. Thank you.